Dearest reader, the time has come to place our bets for the upcoming social season. Greetings, fine ladies and distinguished gentlemen. Tonight we embark on a journey through time, straight to the legendary Regency era, and dive into the dazzling world of British society, ruling the London season known as the Ton. To set the framework right from the start, the Regency period lasted in Great Britain exactly from 1811 to 1820 and corresponded with quite a short time frame, less than a decade, when King George III experienced challenges with his mental health from time to time and his son, the future King George IV, was nominated as his regent. Learn more about it in my dedicated video. This epoch was often characterized as a time of elegance and extravagance, which sort of reflected the personalities of those in power. So no wonder extremities in social life flourished like never before. And here we talk about the thriving era for the most exclusive layer of British society, dubbed in the French manner the Ton. The thing is, it was more than just another slang title for the country's or city's elite or beau monde. The Ton grew to be a much larger, almost institutionalized phenomenon with not only its proper code of conduct, but extremely strict rules of who was considered part of it and who could never be accepted to this club no matter what. And yes, the so-called London season, a well-planned set of opulent balls, lavish dinners and events, was the perfect playground for the elite rubbing shoulders in pursuit of status and alliances a dance of not just waltzes, but of power and influence. So let's uncover the core set of rules and traditions surrounding the town in every detail. The youngest one in particular, I think, will certainly make a match that will be the envy of the town. Remember, I said the French manner, referring to this mystifying tone. Well, like many other particularly exclusive things, the name for this social phenomenon also came from France. Le bon ton in French literally means good manners, doing something in a proper and respected manner. In other words, according to the unanimously agreed code of conduct or etiquette, another French word. In the English language, the proper alternative would be the society, or high elite or polite society. However, back in the beginning of the 19th century, this directness sounded plain and boring, and that's how the word tone established itself in the social vocabularies of the upper classes across La Manche, uh, pardon, the English Channel. The same principle of exclusivity lies in the creation of London's town. Only the chosen few, literally a counted number of families, were included in the circle and this way could mingle with others and the royal family. The loud title or large fortune alone wouldn't open the gates of this strata. One had to be both of blue blood, have lots of lots of old money and, of course, a proper reputation. Since those lucky members of the town didn't have the privilege of keeping their admission pass no matter what. Be it shame or slander, seduction or smear, there is but one thing that humbles even the most highly regarded members of our dear town. A scandal. The privilege of being a member of this circle came with a necessity to follow certain strict rules in this sophisticated code of conduct. One faux pas, misjudgment or even a single misstep could lead to a scandal, pop up in the papers and ruin your reputation, which would immediately lead to the exclusion from the pride. The whole allegory of Lady Whistledown and Bridgerton is quite an accurate, fictionalized analogy of the gossiping and rumors that surrounded socialites at the epoch. 
So, how many people were there in the town? There is a popular misconception of the upper 10,000. Yet, just think of it. Would there be much exclusivity when we are talking thousands? Not really. I have found the information that in 1810 there were 17 dukes, 12 marquises, 94 earls, 23 viscounts, 138 barons in the peerage of England and Great Britain, not counting peers of Ireland and Scotland. Adding the most prominent members of the landed gentry, this brings us closer to the much more accurate assumption of the size of the town to be about a few hundred families at maximum. Sort of celebrities of their epoch, they made headlines being engaged in the so-called annual business of pleasure. I cannot tell you how eager the young ladies are for the upcoming season. As am I. First of all, did it occur to you that the period of London season, lasting roughly from late October to June, initially formed under rather mundane reasons? You see, fathers in the most of the town's families were members of Parliament, so they eventually had to be present at work when Parliament was in session. Moreover, imagine the state of countryside roads in winter in 18th century. Not so handy to travel back and forth from London to the countryside estate, so everyone preferred to settle for the session in the capital. Obviously, they brought their families together with them to London and faced the problem of the proper entertainment of their spouses while they were carrying out their political duties. What's more, the royal family would be normally expected in London in October-December and then April to July, in major part for the same political duty reasons. And the Queen's presence obviously dictated the appropriate social agenda. I believe that Anthony has already replied on our behalf, dearest. Apparently he's managed our social calendar through June. He'll be there for the entire season. And voila! This way, the whole set of upper-class dinner parties, various galas and receptions developed to coincide with the seating of Parliament. The certain dates of the beginning and the ending of the season migrated from October-May in the 18th century to November-June and even January-early August by the 1820s to properly correspond with the changing days of the Parliament sessions. It's funny, since London season's alternative name was simply winter. And this way, by the mid-19th century, winter had shifted into the months of spring and summer. In addition, the state of the countryside rose developed significantly by that time, and it was now quite convenient to travel to and from London. This way, the most active part of the season activities was fixed between Easter and July. Now let's talk money and fashion. Moreover, the phrase au ton would also literally symbolize high fashion. The ladies' gowns were a spectacle of elegance, while the gentlemen sported dashing tailcoats and cravats. And of course, who could forget the iconic Regency hairstyle, the extravagant curls and intricate updos that spoke volumes without uttering a word. Your dresses have arrived! Oh. Oh. <laughs> Young ladies, usually about 16 years old, were introduced at court on two occasions preceding Easter and two occasions following it. For a girl, it was regarded as the official start of her first social season, and everyone in the family needed to make sure their daughter was 100% ready for it. The cost of the season's gowns alone could easily reach up to 500 pounds. Not impressed? Well, I did some research and, for example, according to the Banks of England inflation calculator, 500 pounds in 1810 would be equal to over $40,000 today. Additional expenses included lace, bales, jewels, hairstyling, carriage, and not to forget the extravagant balls held in celebration of the debuts. 
all in all, a moderate estimate of the cost of the season for a family with a debutant lady would be around 900 pounds. It is $75,000 in today's value. To give you another astonishing clue, a laborer all the time would only get about 15 pounds per year. For society men, it was a bit easier, the price for their outfits was less impressive and they often could opt out for uniforms if they served in the military. Now that the season has started, I shall need to fill your coffers at the Modiste and oversee the hiring of a few extra staff. Being seen at the events was important, and there were plenty of balls and parties to attend, with many eligible bachelors present. This could be private balls or those held in public spaces, as well as exclusive members' clubs. Tonight we shall discover which young ladies might succeed at securing a match, thereby avoiding the dreadful, dismal condition known as the spinster. Girls would display their dance cards on their wrists together with a small attached pencil for filling in the names of the partners for the dances. Often these cards served as keepsake souvenirs from each ball, unless it wasn't left half empty for those unlucky less popular ones. Lord Byron. Wellington! Oh, Louise, these names are false! I'm merely following my sister's valuable advice. She told me that it is of the utmost importance for a lady's dance card to be filled with all of the right names. <laughs> Eloise! <laughs> all that was done to make appropriate matches for the younger members of the circle and fuel careers and simply entertain the mature sharks of this social tank. And there you have it, a glimpse into the enchanting world of Regency London society. Did you enjoy the journey through time? I'll be happy to discuss this wonderful epoch and its traditions down there in the comments. And of course, thank you for your support. Take care and I'll see you in my other videos. Bye!